and Charlie is a dearer, friendlier kind of name than Mike. Right. Because there were there was no Michael in Iowa. Oh, there wasn't. No. So everybody calls you Mike growing up. Yeah. Oh, if do I people go, call you Mike now? If I go back, yeah, anyone. Only there. Only there, and I and I have one, one kind of friend for life who. Just insists on it. <laughs> I cannot see you as Mike. Right? I don't. I don't really. All. I hardly respond to. How would you describe your relationship with your mother? With my mom? Yeah. It was really good. My mom was my number one supporter. Yeah. My mom had a, an unshakable belief in me, and the love she gave me was unconditional always was I, w I was so blessed I see it now as a grown-up mm -hmm. out in the world I see how many people did not have that as a as the base yeah I think that's common so it's from, more common to have the opposite yeah from well, which from which they because for me then I why would I not have confidence then and go out in the world mm -hmm. and do things and and your father he was just a quiet Midwestern man, kind of a blue collar Midwestern man, a farmer's son. And not, a, you know, a, a quiet, easygoing person who didn't have big ambitions. He was not mm -hmm. a reader or a anything like he and I had very little in common except our our blood kinship. Did he support you? Like, was he accepting of you? Yeah, generally? I think he was. I think he was mystified by me. Okay. I think he was. He was not a terribly verbal person. Uh -huh. So I think he was mystified to have a chattery little right. boy in his life all those years, who then went off to be a chattery, artsy grown up. And he, and then when he began to see me on his own television set, I don't think he quite knew what to make of it. You know. It would be like. What did he say? He would just say. He, his nickname for me was Charlie. I don't yeah, know I where he got that. I remember you said he that. He would say Charlie. Uh, it's really something. I don't, I don't know. He he would say the thing that people from his part of the world say, which is, I don't know how you learned all those lines. Well, Dad, you just do. It's part of the deal. If you can't do that, then you can't have the part. <laughs> you can't be on TV. <laughs> right. I can I can picture you because you are also so articulate and you have such a great vocabulary. Y you were probably like that from the get go, right? When you were a little kid. Yeah, were, I think I was. Do you remember people telling you that? I remember people telling me that I had a funny voice. I remember my aunt Sue putting her hand over my mouth when we were singing hymns in church because <laughs> my pitch was not that good. It's much better now. <laughs> Oh, boy. But I guess I, I was talkative. I would talk to strangers. And I know where I got that. I got that from my mother. Because my mom's one of those Midwestern ladies. When she comes to New York City, she there are no strangers. Mm. She stops and engages in conversation with whoever it is. The doorman at the hotel or a homeless person or shopkeepers. People standing on line. At yeah. I love that. The ice cream vendor. You, you know, she. Yeah. Personally, I love that. It's, it's sweet, but it can also get you into situations. Like what? You know, pe people then, sometimes people have an agenda or want to sell her something uh, or, okay. or tie her up for a while or sh show her a great opportunity uh. that they know about or tickets to this or that. Or <laughs> but no, it's fine. But so you got that from her. That's well, the, what you took from her. Yeah. Yeah. Or not took. But partly I'm projecting on her, too. I, I realized how callow I was when I came to New York City from Iowa. And it took me a long time, I think. And this is not necessarily a plus, but to get a little more of a New York shell on me and to not not be. Not walk around. Open mouthed with wonder or looking up at the tall buildings or all those things you do when you're from Des Moines mm -hmm. and not from here. Mm -hmm. 
and it it can make you a target. Yes. I still like to look at the buildings. I do. I do too. I and know you can't, but yeah. But still, now I have. I'm still drawn to. But now I have. Now I know how to deal with whatever New York throws at me, or I feel like I do. Right, you have street smarts. Part. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's the best of both, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and your father called you Charlie, and he called your mother Clyde. Clyde. God, we had this conversation. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Yes, and because I remember Charlie, because my son's name is Charlie, and then we talked about the fact that Charlie is a good guy, like the name, like all the yeah, Charlies that's right. are good. That's right. Yeah. Because they are. But I remember you saying that for, you weren't sure why or why you didn't tell me the other things about your parents. But I do remember yeah. you saying that, which is interesting. I don't know why you didn't name me Charlie. Well, I don't think he I don't think he felt he had a vote. I think in that, you know, in 1954, yeah. you know, the, the husband of a good Catholic girl kind of left the naming. Right. To right. the mother of the child. So I have this weird thought that I feel like. You know, we all name kids before they're born. Not all, because there are certain cultures that don't. And I feel like that's the way to do it is wait until you see the personality. Like, I bet he started calling you Charlie after you were Pro existing. Probably. Ba based on. There was something Charlie-ish about you. Whatever he observed about yeah. me as a person. Yeah. yeah. I kind of feel like that would be good. That's to a just pleasant name thought. People. I don't know what you call people before. Or, you know, the, if you don't do that, right. what do you call your baby? But I don't know. And Charlie is a dearer, friendlier kind of name than Mike. Right. Because there were there was no Michael in Iowa. Oh, there wasn't. No. So everybody calls you Mike growing up. Yeah. Oh, if do I people go, call you Mike now? If I go back, yeah, anyone, only there. Only there, and I and I have one, one kind of friend for life who. Just insists on it. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot see you as Mike. Right? I don't I don't really all. I hardly respond to it, you know, but when you said Mike, I had to think what you were talking about Mike, for a second. Yeah. I was like, what is he saying, Mike? Cuz I I didn't picture that. As you're, to me you are Michael, but you are Michael, I think. Michael is appropriate I think for you. So. I think it's all right. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. Um, but we, when you grow up in a little farm town in Iowa, you don't you don't keep the right. The 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 name on your birth certificate, there has to be a shortened form of that. Yeah. Well, my son's name is actually Charlie on his birth certificate. It is oh. not Charles. Oh, great. He is Charlie. That's it. Oh, so that's So we have great. to explain that sometimes. Yeah. I remember, you know, sometimes people will call him Charles. Yeah. And he has to correct <laughs> It's like the opposite of, of what you would think. It's the opposite that's, of I'm Michael, not yeah, Mike. Yeah, that's good. I'm Charlie, not that's good. Charles. All right. I have some things I want to run by you because I feel like sometimes I did this with one other person once. and I feel like it's super interesting because of your way of seeing things. I feel like you're a very thoughtful person. I'm going to give you some sayings and let's talk about if we if we buy these sayings or not. I don't mean that's I okay. shouldn't even prefaced it at all because it's not as complicated as, as it sounds. All right. All you need is love. Yes. No. Maybe. What do you think about that? that expression or that saying, all you need is love. It's not my favorite Beatles song. Okay. And I, I think it's, it's, it's too general to have bite if you ask me. Okay. Should we go more specific? <laughs> Familiarity breeds contempt. Is it Shakespearean? I can't remember. It's, it's apt. But it's only half of a dynamic. If there is no spice or newness in a thing, let's say a work of art or let's say a performer, uh -huh. then you can, you, begin, you, you risk disenchantment. But I think in relationships and stuff, f familiarity is what you crave. Mm -hmm. Familiarity breeds your bond with your uh -huh. loved ones, spouse, right. lover. I think also, you. I'm just going to put my own take on it. I feel like it depends on the person, too. Whereas some people really appreciate novelty in life and others appreciate routine and predictability. So maybe in some ways it might apply more to... If based on what your perspective and your personality is. Yeah. 
Are you a novelty person or are you a uh, stability person? I subscribe to that quote from, oh, what author is it? Is it a French author? Is it Balzac? Someone who said something on the order of, be quiet and orderly in your life that you may be wild and adventurous or in your work. Oh, that's interesting. And I, I have it in, I have it in the box. I keep my watches and cufflinks in. Oh, I can't shoot. How can I not know the exact quote? And and you've seen it a million <laughs> times. But anyway, I, I subscribe to it. I think I I like. We, we live a quiet, orderly life at home. It's a, it's a comfort, and I think it is, just like my mother's love, it is a thing that gives you the confidence and the courage to go out into the world mm -hmm. and do something daring like a play in front of a live audience. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, for somebody who is a perfectionist and likes things controlled or controllable you really chose a career that is not as if as if to push the envelope yeah. of, of my very own sense of control to do the high yeah. wire to do the high wire act to see if i can although and, I, and you can if you if you're a if you're a super careful preparer But interestingly, you've had these really meaty jobs, roles, where you are on these at least the most predictable type of show that you could get, right? So it's like you're not going from project to project. To, I mean, you are to some degree, but less so than you would if you were, you know, you're, you're getting these, what is it? A stable. They're stable. They, yeah. they're, they season after season yes. on network television. <laughs> Um, do you still call it network television if it's Paramount Plus? Yeah, I would call it network. It's a CBS production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to say yes to but that. But network pretty soon won't be a yeah, word. Right. People will be like, what? Net what? Um, but yes, you have, I think people would kill for that kind of stability, it's, right, that you've had three times at least, right, for that. And then you still get to do the other projects on the side this is true. that you're passionate about. So, but they, but you're not only doing that, so it doesn't have to stress you out that, right? What's happening now or next, right? It's kind of like a perfect. You've you've created the per, you've controlled the perfect career for yourself. To some extent, it's in, inadvertent, unintentional. But yes, I I have I have had good fortune to to play s solid roles that stayed interesting mm. to me and and to audiences too i think over a long time and it, was, it has been stable and regular and i haven't i haven't been out in the cold trying to figure out an angle for auditioning mm. like i like i used to have to do yeah so i'm really racking my brain and you're kind of stumping me on why you feel like you need to have control over things and be a perfectionist. I can't figure out, based on what you're telling me about your parents and everything else, I don't know where that would have developed. And it's, it could just be a personality trait. But usually it's in response to something else. You know what I mean? Yeah. What it, do you think? It might have been, because I, I, I date my sort of obsessiveness to my early years in New York when I was a magazine illustrator. Okay. And the kind of drawings I was doing were very particular and very detailed, and they required an absolutely clean workspace and pencils as sharp as a scalpel. And, and I couldn't work if there was any housework left to be done in the apartment, because I was working at home. Oh. So I, the, the, it had to be tidy, dishes done and put away, laundry done now I can work now there's nothing distracting now I don't need to drift away and do some housework I had to corner myself uh -huh. to be focused and I think I sort of held on to that as maybe a work method or mm. what were the illustrations exactly why were they so precise they were they were little black and white drawings done with a, a very dark black pencil that wasn't erasable 
So oh. I, I had to be careful. Okay. Did anything happen where you weren't once and something devastating happened? Oh, yeah. I had, ma I had many of those kind of s spill something on the finished art or uh, s slip with the pencil and make a line, a dark black line through a space that was supposed to be white. You know, just that, yeah. that kind of thing. But that would have to happen. That's part of. And I think in, in a way to 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 make that workspace for me so controlled was also a way to control my my, my anxiety about being in this huge teeming city where the likelihood of my success was very low. Now we're on to something. Yeah, oh, that could be it. It could be New York. Yeah, could be New York that did it to you. Could be. Yeah. So why did you decide to come to New York again? A, a, an ill-considered romantic oh, relationship. Oh, that's right. And then <laughs> it didn't work out, and then you moved to St. Augustine. Well, it, yeah. Uh, the the one the relationship that brought me here ended, and then I moved to Brooklyn and started drawing pictures, and then I had some other relationships there. But one of them took me to Florida. Oh, okay. Oh, so it was an ill-conceived one that brought you to New York. So it wasn't you that was coming to New York. For you, it was not, not originally. I, I would not have been brave enough, but I, fo I followed a another person. So, how long was it before the relationship but ended? We, we, we stayed together for two years, which is about 18 months oh. longer than made sense okay i feel like now my analysis is going to be that it was that whole period of time of you coming to new york 18 months out of 24 yeah. were uneasy yeah. and that was it was time to you were probably nervous and anxious i was always nervous i had barely enough money to get by you know to pay rent when when it when that relationship actually broke up mm -hmm. I didn't know how I was going to make rent anywhere. I got the cheapest apartment I had ever heard of in Brooklyn. And that was my ticket out. Out to out to the beginning of my life as myself. Isn't that interesting? So you still wanted to stay. Yeah, because some some of the life here was really fun. And my various retail jobs, I made good friends. Mm. And we had fun. We had fun times. In you know, we would go out, go to the movies, or go have Chinese food, or something that didn't cost a lot of money. So that that was all good. I didn't. And what had I to go back to? Not, not right, really anything right. in Iowa. Right. Do you remember how much the apartment was? Do you have the number in your head still? I do. It was one hundred and forty dollars a month. What was on, it? Your own place on Seventh Avenue in Park Slope. That was quite a steal. Yeah, and like everything else in New York, there's a story. You know, my landlady was a was a kind of crazy lady in the neighborhood named Mrs. Nelson, and she dressed exotically, and you'd see her on the street, and I think a lot of people thought she was maybe a crazy person or or maybe had nowhere to live or something, but she was just frugal uh -huh. <laughs> and she looked it and she kept, she had this building and she rented and some of my neighbors were really strange people, but it, you know, it was a story. It was, you know, it was yeah. a great story. I would imagine like you can just, cause there are so many characters here too. Aren't there so many oh, characters? Like nothing I had ever, you, there's nothing. I don't know three people in Iowa that were as strange as 10,000 people I know in New York City. They're just, everybody's sort of a regular person. Right. So regular, but I didn't want regular. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to be where the characters were. Yeah, and you are where the characters are. <laughs> and you're a lot of the characters yourself. You're taking from the yes. characters that you've met and seen. Yeah, that's right. And created all those characters yeah. out of all of that. <laughs> there are some characters in California too. No question. But <laughs> they're different characters. Yeah, they are. How would you how would you describe the difference? I respond to the characters in New York City better than the characters in LA. And I, I think it's because they seem like they're figures out of literature or dramas or comedies or something. 
I can cast them in my mind into a narrative context. I, it's a little harder for me to do in LA. I don't know what it is. It's just taste, partly. I, I'm interested in the kind of urbanness of the characters I made here, and, and less so into the back to the land kind of people or ex exotic uh, spirituality and religions that you run into that I think of as a more West Coast thing. Mm. Of course, it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I do feel like that too. I used to notice that when I would go, because I record in New York, but when I would go to LA a few times a year, I'd go for like a week and I'd tape a bunch of shows and I would notice that this like mystical thing, this topic or whatever, it was common when I would be out yeah. there. It was like a lot of my guests would bring things like that up yeah. and then I would notice this is really California. I was always outside of that. So I was not a natural fit uh -huh. for California. I love zooming around LA at night in a car and, and going to, you know, the restaurants and music clubs and stuff. That yeah. was all that was all great. Yeah. I have mixed feelings about it too. I like going out there. I love it. I do feel like when I'm back here when I come back though, I'm like, I'm I'm with my people again. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, I see what you mean. There's a lot to, yeah, it's it's that, I don't know, I don't want to judge the whole state of people or whatever else, but I see what you're saying where you would feel like, but there were people, more people like you there too, right? Of course. Yeah. But just not the majority, maybe. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We had lots of good friends there, and we yeah. had great, funny people to hang out with, and yeah. all, all of that is yeah. good. But you have, to, you have to drive a lot. Right to but, mingle with your friends right i do feel like something i noticed i was just there last week and i did notice when i was there that it does seem like there is this community there of like the entertainment world it does seem much more of like a network or a web or something more than it is here i feel like and maybe it's because i i don't know because of who i was with last week i'm not really sure but it does seem like here everybody's a little bit more doing their own thing while still knowing each other and be having their friends. You know what I'm saying? But it's less. Yeah. Do you, do you know what I mean? I, I have I have a different angle on oh, okay. that. I because I have at sometimes been part of the New York live stage community. That's the different. Nothing's tighter than that. Yeah, one. Yeah. And, you know, everybody mm. in that world is small. It. In L.A., there's no theater yeah. community. There's showbiz, but that's bigger and big. more spread out. And showbiz in New York is big and spread out, too. But as a club, the New York theater is seems to me the tightest, tightest. that I've ever experienced. And truest, probably. Probably. Right. Yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. And there are some there are some people in New York who I have had on my show who I've talked to, and it's that same. They know each other, and they they're all part yeah. of that community. It's Jessica Hecht, and it's Griffin Dunn, and Yul oh, Vazquez, yeah. and Eric Bogosian, and am I naming some of the names? Kate Burton. Kate Burton. <laughs> Whenever I think of who should be the who should be the Duchess of the New York Theater, I think Kate Burton okay. is a, is a is a good choice, even though I, I, I don't think she lives here anymore. Maybe, maybe she does. Oh, really? Well, that's I, but, you know, talk about somebody who knew everyone. everybody. OK, but if you do enough plays in this town, you pretty much do know everybody. Right. True. And that's the nice thing about New York, too. All right. We love New York. It's been established. Yeah. All right. We have to close because you have to leave in a few minutes. Oh, so oh. did we not get to anything that we should get to we'll save things for next time well there'll, yeah, be, there'll sure. be a third show no i think this is a great conversation okay good and I, a, lot, a lot of a surprising conversation i have to tell you i was a little bit intimidated before this you know why because i remembered how great our last conversation was oh uh, yeah and i was like oh shoot can i replicate the quality of that conversation yeah. a second time yeah this was totally different but i feel like we did in totally a different, different way but equally great i mean re responding to those what do you even call those quotes you read? Are they aphorisms? I don't or? know. I was, when I looked at them, I got them. I did it for Alan Cumming. I'll, I'll tell you exactly the details. Alan Cumming was coming to on the show, and I felt like he'd been interviewed a million times. I'm sure a he million. has. And even has, he has a website that has, like, every question anybody ever asked him done. 
He'd written a book. I'm like, I don't want to ask him the same questions. So I start. I got this idea to look up these sayings, and I think I remembered it saying. I remember seeing proverbs, but I felt like that's not the right word. Proverbs. Well, they are. Do you think proverbs is right? Yes, not in the biblical sense, okay. but yes, they they some of those are proverbs, as you would find in a fortune cookie. Yeah, in yeah, some yeah, cases. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. So what about those? You were saying I cut you off. So what about the? I thought that was a good. That's a good starter. Okay. For someone that's opinionated like I am. Right. Well, I, thought that, I was like, Michael will be great at responding to these because you're going to have interesting perspective on everything because yeah. you have a very interesting perspective. So I appreciate that. I'm going to look up that quote yeah, look from up the that French quote. author. Okay. Because I, I think it's meaningful. I don't keep many quotes around, but that one I keep. A good quote is a good thing. When it really resonates, you feel it like viscerally. You're like, that's the thing. Yeah. You hold on to that. Yeah. All right, so we will we'll, we'll do another interesting but different conversation the third on the third episode of yeah Michael Emerson comes to really famous okay. to talk to Kara. We must. We must. <laughs> Thank you for this. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. It was fun. <laughs>